opening intro music is so damn good. Welcome back to the channel, folks. If you recall during my Godfather review, I called the game a serviceable adaptation of the movie, but that its main character Aldo and by extension his story were very underwhelming. And I suggested that if you were looking for a mob-themed game, you were better off playing Mafia instead. I still stand by that statement, but Mafia, the original version, is a completely different beast than The Godfather. It's not cut from the same GTA-like cloth either. Instead being a traditional action-adventure game, gameplay and level design being similar to Max Payne or Hitman, and as I came to realize, bizarrely enough, The Getaway. I'm wondering if that game could have stood out more and been a little more ambitious if it aimed to be on PC and not PS2. Now, a roadblock I ran into when wanting to review and discuss the game for the channel was whether to tackle the original or the remake released in 2020. Since most of my videos tend to cover the original versions or releases of games, the 2002 release felt like it made the most sense, though I remembered that the Definitive Edition was supposedly a faithful remake and not one that completely reinterpreted the original. So putting it to a poll and reading through the comments, I said screw it, why not do both? This video won't be about determining which one is better, as I think both have their own merits and are worth playing. It'll be more about comparing each one's strengths, how faithful of a remake the Definitive Edition is, and if the original still holds up today. Now when it comes to reviewing older games, when possible, I like to go with the version I played when I was a kid, which in this case was on the PS2. I cannot in good conscience do that here though, as the PS2 port of Mafia is terrible and does not do the game justice. Other than the obvious graphical downgrade, and the fact most cutscenes are pre-rendered video, and not in-game cutscenes, the biggest issue is controls. Shooting and combat is awkward as all hell on the controller, with an auto-aim system that doesn't seem to function unless you're right up next to an enemy. This makes shootouts and fights much more tedious than the PC version, though not necessarily harder. I'll get into that later, but the only saving grace of the PS2 version is the driving, which while not terrible by any means on the PC, just functions a little better with a controller, making a certain infamous mission a cakewalk. Then there's the audio mixing, which I'm not 100% sure if it's the emulator or not, but the sound effects and especially the sound of your car would end up drowning out the game's background music. And then the biggest issue with the PS2 version, the load times. Like holy shit, it takes forever for a new mission to begin, or the screen to transition when entering a new island. It's the absolute worst and insanely distracting, as a lot of chase sequences will have you go through the separate areas of Lost Heaven. Expect to briefly drive through one part of the map, cross a bridge, and wait twice as long for the next area to load. If you played Mafia when you were younger and hated it, chances are it was the PS2 version, and I can't really fault you for feeling that way. But that's because of the shitty porting job, and really shouldn't be a reflection on the actual game. The game is set in the fictional city of Lost Heaven during the Great Depression and the final years of Prohibition. I thought it was set in New Jersey or New York, but as it turns out, it's actually set in Illinois. The game begins with Tommy Angelo, your playable character, sitting down to speak with Detective John Norman, offering up information on the Mafia family he's become a part of in exchange for immunity and protection. This framing device shows how Tommy went from a simple taxi driver trying to make a living to joining the Salieri crime family rising up its ranks and how he inevitably became disillusioned with the mob lifestyle. Explaining the crimes he committed, the friends and enemies he made while working for Don Salieri, and ultimately what brought him to his cafe to try and walk away from it all. The game's story spans eight years, often skipping ahead a few years after completing some levels, occasionally returning to the present with the interview between Tommy and Detective Norman. Both versions of the game maintain this structure, and the story follows almost the exact same beats, but it's not a shot-for-shot -shot remake. But I'll circle back to the story later to go over the differences between the two. Like I mentioned earlier, Mafia is an action-adventure game with a fairly linear level structure, 
that has you pick up the next mission as soon as the last one ends. There are very rare opportunities that you'll get to explore Lost Heaven at your own pace, but to make up for this, the game does offer a free ride mode. Free ride will let you hop in a car, drive around to take in the sights, get into shootouts with the cops, and steal new cars for your garage. Rather surprisingly, and refreshingly, the Definitive Edition kept that exact same design choice. With two decades separating both versions of the game, I think it would have been tempting to just fart out another open world sandbox game, adding annoying quest markers, dumb and half-assed side content, or creating a bunch of filler content between main story missions. It did add some collectible comics, cigarette cards, and stuffed foxes to give you a little more to do in Lost Heaven, but outside of an achievement, there's no reason to go out of your way to find them. I dig them though, but that's mainly because I'm a sucker for these type of old comics and art style. As someone suffering from open world fatigue, it was nice to play a game that was more focused and compact. This kept both versions of the game from feeling too bloated, and I was able to comfortably beat both of them in about 15 hours each. This also made it much easier to play and record both games back to back in less than a week. Not the easiest thing for me as I still have a full time job and other commitments outside of making videos for the channel. Circling back to Lost Heaven, let's talk about the graphics and art style for both games. Now comparing two games separated by 20 years, obviously the Definitive Edition would have better graphics by modern standards, but the original is no slouch. I downloaded the version that's available on Steam, and I'm not sure if it got some kind of enhancement or not, but the graphics still look good. It really captures that era of 2000s gaming, with simpler textures and geometry, though the textures for the HUD and in-game text are kind of blurry. So I did download a mod to clean those up and fix an issue with draw distance, but I avoided the remastered community mod, as while it makes the game look even better, I wanted to stay as close to the original look as I could. The original Lost Heaven has this depressing and dirty feel to it. Driving around, you'll see rusted signs and infrastructure, shanty towns, or Hoovervilles I guess, taking up alleyways and certain parts of town, along with several storefronts boarded up, having long since gone out of business, it really captures the feeling of an America suffering through the Great Depression, where unemployment was high, parts of the country were starving due to the Dust Bowl, and people turned to crime as a means of survival. Prohibition going on at the same time causing crime to skyrocket, and making the ordinary Joe on the street even more miserable. Could you imagine? You lost your job, you're living in a shack the size of a closet with your family, and you can't even drink some booze legally to forget your troubles. We really do have it good nowadays, don't we? It does a great job contrasting the various areas, as traveling outside the main city to the more affluent suburbs of Oakwood and Beach Hill, you'll see not everyone is struggling, with the middle and upper classes living that more glamorized life of the 1930s you see in pop culture. The Definitive Edition, on the other hand, feels too clean and sterilized. The game is gorgeous, don't get me wrong, it's very vibrant, and the glowing neon signs during the night really make the city pop, but I don't think it conveys a depressing time period very well. This version of Lost Heaven really does feel like the glamorized version of the time period, and ends up losing some of the atmosphere the original created. I think either muting the brighter colors, or adding more trash and grime to the streets could have helped replicate the feeling better. You do experience and see that decay and dirtiness to the city during certain levels, but still experience more of the better looking parts as you drive. I don't know, could just be me. You guys let me know how you feel. I think the overall atmosphere was probably harder to replicate with modern, realistic graphics, without the fear of modern players thinking your game had bad graphics. Both versions of Mafia play from third person, though the originals zoomed in much closer, only showing the back of Tommy's head and upper back. That closer perspective also ends up messing with the camera, as when he enters smaller rooms or hugs a wall, it has a tendency to zoom into first person until you move him. Controlling Tommy feels fine. In the original version, he automatically sprints in every direction and you need to hold down a button to make him walk. The remake does the opposite, having him walk rather slow unless you hold the sprint button. And man, does it feel so much slower here. It's that annoying game design that Yakuza does, where you're not allowed to sprint inside certain indoor areas, in this case your main hub, Salieri's Bar. Since just about every mission begins and ends here, 
you're going to feel like a glacier every single time you boot up the game. Like other modern games, it also does that annoying thing where you're forced to walk and listen to an NPC as you follow them. His sprinting also feels weird. Part of it's because the default control scheme on a controller to make him run is pushing in the left analog stick, which I'm just not a big fan of in any game. But also because he has a bit too much momentum to him. As he tends to awkwardly stop when I let go of sprint or need to change directions. Yeah, I know it's technically more realistic and how an actual person runs, but it always feels weird in video games. This issue with momentum also affects climbing in the Definitive Edition. As I tend to walk into an object, pause, and then begin climbing, as opposed to the original that feels a lot smoother. Not terrible, and if anything, it's how a lot of modern games handle climbing onto an object. It's just something I notice playing both games back to back. Again, this might be more of a me thing, as I'm also still playing Tears of the Kingdom, which handles climbing in its own way, so some wires might be getting crossed in my brain. Continuing the discussion of gameplay, let's move on to the combat, which makes use of both melee and shooting. In the original version, melee combat consists of swinging your fists or whatever melee weapon you're holding into an enemy and smashing into them over and over until they die. You can also hold down the attack button to wind up an attack, doing more damage or if you're standing behind an enemy with something like a bat, letting you instantly knock them out, though your wind up can easily be interrupted by another enemy attacking you. While one-on-one -on -one combat is fine, it's when you're being attacked by multiple enemies that it can be frustrating, as their repeated attacks will constantly interrupt you and keep you from fighting back, easily stunlocking you to death if you can't manage to break away. Usually the best way to handle a group is to be constantly backing up as you attack them, keeping some distance while still doing damage. In the Definitive Edition, melee is a lot smoother, and you're given the option to counter an attack to prevent you from being stunlocked. There isn't a sophisticated combo system or anything. Just mash the attack button until Tommy enters the animation to defeat an enemy with the finishing move. It feels a little overpowered, at least on the normal difficulty, as if you mash fast enough, your opponent won't get in a hit at all. To go with melee, you also have a rather simple stealth system, but simple for each version of the game for different reasons. In the original game, it boils down to just sneaking up on an enemy and knocking them out before they notice you occasionally using cover to hide or wait for someone to walk past so you can get by, but that's about it. I wouldn't really call it a stealth system, if only because the game doesn't really force you to be sneaky, as if you get spotted you won't instantly fail and be sent back to the checkpoint. I'd say the best example of what I'm talking about is during the mission visiting rich people. In this one you have to sneak into a prosecutor's home to steal evidence while he's away. You first sneak through a garden maze being patrolled by his guards, and once inside his house need to avoid bumping into his maid. In his house you have to keep the lights off and close any doors you open to avoid suspicion, till you find the safe and trigger the checkpoint as the prosecutor arrives home. But if you already know where the safe is, even if you get spotted and start getting shot at, as long as you reach the safe before you or the safe cracker you have with you die, you'll still pass. So the mechanics and setup for stealth is there, but it's not really forced on you. Also, some sequences seem impossible to do without being spotted. For example, a later level in the old prison, I try to sneak past a group of guys, and even with their backs turned to me, I still aggro them. The Definitive Edition makes use of simple stealth mechanics that you see in a lot of modern AAA games. First, you're given a more proper silent takedown, letting you choke someone from behind to knock them out, or knocking them out with whatever you're holding. Next, some missions have been redesigned to be all about stealth. For example, the aforementioned visiting rich people. It's the same setup of having to sneak into the prosecutor's house, but with a much larger maze and more guards to get through first. You now have that attention meter you see in stealth games, which points in the direction of enemy who can see you, growing in intensity the longer you hang around and the closer they get to you. If you get spotted, you'll raise the alarm and instantly fail, so you're forced to do it stealthily this time. But it's honestly super easy. As you'll see the patrolling enemies on your minimap and what direction they're facing. So you can follow them, knock them out, and move on to the next guy. I don't think the same rules of avoiding the maid apply. At least from what I could tell, as when I did run into her, I just punched her till she shut up. Also, after knocking someone out, you're given the option to pick up and move their bodies. 
You can't hide them in the trash or a large object like in, say, Hitman. And I don't know that you ever really need to move them either. Outside of maybe visiting rich people, in most missions, the guards are spread so far from each other and rarely cross through the same patrol route, so you'd never have to worry about someone finding them. I am playing on normal mode though, so maybe on the higher difficulties they do add in more guards to force you to plan and hide bodies. Melee and sword of stealth only make up a small bit of combat though, as the game is mostly about pumping rival mobsters full of lead. The selection of guns in this game is small, mostly because of the time period, limiting you to a few pistols, revolvers, a pump shotgun, sawn-off shotgun, the Thompson or Tommy gun, and a bolt-action rifle. You can't buy weapons and instead at the beginning of each mission, you'll visit the Salieri family's gunsmith Vincenzo. Depending on the mission, he'll provide you with the necessary loadout for the job, and occasionally with throwables like molotovs and grenades. Though he never gives you the heavier weapons like the Tommy gun or pump shotgun, and you'll always have to pick those off of enemies. In the original game, you can carry multiple small sidearms and two larger firearms, sorta. Due to the size of certain guns, mainly the pump shotgun and rifle, you can't actually hide them in your inventory and get a prompt saying as such. So you have to keep it equipped in order to hold on to it, risking the cops or civilians seeing it. Otherwise, you'll end up dropping it when entering a car or leaving a level. While you'll rarely, if ever, start a mission completely loaded, you can pick up weapons from enemies you take out and pick up any ammo they drop. Some levels will also place extra weapons and ammo drops to assist with the tougher fights. Shooting is fairly standard, with the usual mouse and keyboard setup we've had for so long now, with each gun having its strengths and weaknesses. Pistols hold a mid-sized clip, are your most accurate weapon, and the best for long distance shots, but do the least damage. The pump shotgun does a lot of damage up close and can send an enemy flying back but has terrible accuracy at a distance. And the Tommy gun has the fastest rate of fire with the largest clip, easily able to mow down a group of goons, but it has terrible recoil the longer you hold down fire, killing your accuracy. It doesn't really matter what you bring into a shootout, as it's less about using the best gun and more about positioning, cause holy shit are shootouts brutal in this game. Your enemies tend to be very aggressive, overwhelming you with numbers and making clever use of cover hiding after taking their shots and avoiding reloading out in the open, sometimes even shooting blind from behind cover as opposed to peeking out completely. Depending on the level, they'll come after you to flush you out of cover or sneak around you in the more open levels. You also don't have any enemy markers on the screen to tell you where they are or how many you're fighting. Not to mention some may pop up out of a door after you just finished off their buddies. You have to play like your enemies, understand the layout of the level, and hide behind cover after killing someone as getting too greedy can get you killed fast. Like them, you don't want to reload out in the open, as the reload animation for each gun is very slow, and can leave you a sitting duck just long enough to get killed. Also, I didn't realize this until maybe halfway through the original game, but reloading will cause you to drop all the remaining ammo in your current clip. Yeah, none of that Call of Duty bullshit of smashing a fresh clip into your assault rifle to refill two bullets of a clip of 30. And holy shit, was this the absolute hardest thing to unlearn. I'm so used to reloading a gun to make sure it's always topped off that it's basically become second nature. So even when I realized I was throwing away ammo, I was still accidentally reloading instead of letting my clip run out. That added realism makes the shootouts even tougher, as you might burn through your ammo too fast, but if you engage an enemy without your clip being full, you could run out at the wrong moment and get killed as you reload. The best approach I found was to switch weapons when I couldn't reload, as swapping guns is faster than reloading and can save you in a pinch. The other thing to keep note of is your health, as 100 HP is the max you will ever have. There's no body armor you can pick up to extend your defense. And while the game does have health pickups, they're usually rare, sometimes only giving you one or two at most throughout some very big levels. They take the form of painkillers that are hidden behind a yellow medicine cabinet marked with a red cross which can be easy to miss if you don't pay attention to your surroundings or search every room. You can't hold on to them as they're instantly used up when picked up and typically only heal a third of your health. So depending on the situation, you'll have to decide if it's better to heal as soon as you can or risk saving it till you absolutely need it. And we're not done quite yet, as some missions will have you working with your friends Polly, Sam, or some other NPC who have their own health bar. 
While they are surprisingly competent for NPC companions, avoiding blindingly charging into fights, using cover, and even keeping aggro off you, they're just as squishy as you are, can't be healed at all, and aren't immune to friendly fire, which means you could easily kill them by mistake and fail a level. Not helped as they can easily blend in with a crowd of other mobsters. Oh, and as one last fuck you, some encounters start you right in front of your enemies, which means you're guaranteed to take some damage before you even have a chance to move. All of these factors combined created some of the most punishing and unforgiving shooting encounters I've ever experienced in any game. While it's refreshing to experience a challenging game that demands a lot of the player and doesn't hold your hand, I'd be lying if I didn't admit how frustrating it felt to get through some of the tougher levels. Now that you've got a clear picture of what the original was like, how does the Definitive Edition compare? Well, it basically nukes the difficulty from Orbit, by adding all the modern, quality of life improvements and the usual hand-holding options in modern games. For one, while shooting, the camera will switch to a closer behind-the-shoulder perspective, making your accuracy better. Vincenzo will offer better weapons the further you get into the game, not just limiting you to a pistol, bat, or Lupara shotgun. Here, while you can switch between your primary and secondary gun fast with the press of a button, you can also make use of a weapon wheel to swap weapons. This lets you slow down the action around you, while also quickly swapping to a melee weapon, throwable, or just holstering your weapon. Though you're limited in the guns you can carry, this time only two, one sidearm and one two-handed weapon. Throwables get more use here, with several levels having a box of molotovs or grenades sitting around, easily marked off on your minimap to find. Also, you don't have to worry about your NPC companions anymore, and they're immune to your shots too. The Definitive Edition makes use of a proper cover system, snapping you onto a piece of cover instantly and letting you peek from it to take your shots. Unlike the original where you awkwardly crouched behind a box or just stood behind a wall. While the enemy AI still makes use of cover, they're considerably less aggressive and will loudly shout to the player when they're reloading or throwing a molotov or grenade. Simplifying them even more, your minimap will show their locations, so you won't be caught off guard by an enemy you missed and will also know how many you have left in an encounter. Your health system was also reworked, as while there still isn't armor, when you're on low health, if you wait long enough it will regenerate up to 20%, keeping you in the fight and potentially avoiding being killed the next time you're shot. Health kits are also more plentiful, are marked off on your map, and heal you for more as well. While this does make shootouts considerably easier compared to the original, it does try to balance the difficulty, first by changing the layout and positioning of some enemies, equipping more of them with stronger weapons, including quite a few using sniper rifles. They also tend to use more throwables as well, forcing you to move from your cover if you stand still too long. Now that said, while the base difficulty is basically a cakewalk compared to the 2002 original, you can recreate that old school challenge, as you can change the difficulty to classic mode, making enemies more aggressive, removing their icons from your minimap, disabling your health regen and lowering the amount of ammo and throwables dropped, so while the original is still tougher, the definitive edition is as easy or as hard as you want it to be. So customize it to the experience you prefer and have fun. So the other big component of this game, and the one that will eat up most of your playthrough, is driving. Cars in Mafia, or jalopies as they were called back then, are all modeled and named after their real counterparts from the 1920s and 30s. At the beginning of most missions, you can visit the Salieri family's mechanic Ralphie for a set of wheels. As the game progresses, he'll teach you how to break into different models of cars, which just involves holding down the interact button for a few seconds before you can unlock the car. Seems weird, but really it's the game's way of keeping you from picking up a fast ride right off the bat. Any wheels you do steal, you can bring back to Ralphie to add to your personal garage. The way cars handle in Mafia is pretty similar to cars in the getaway, having some decent weight to them and some realistic handling as you make turns. You have the option of using either automatic or manual controls, with automatic accelerating slower but shifting gears on its own. While manual control will accelerate your car faster, you just need to manually shift gears in order to increase your speed. You know, standard car stuff. Probably. I don't know. I could not drive a stick shift for the life of me. Despite Mafia's reputation for its tougher driving controls, I never found them too bad or disruptive. At most, I had to be careful rounding corners at higher speeds. There was this one time I got stuck trying to ascend a steep road and couldn't get my car to move at all, 
which I'm only just realizing is probably because I didn't shift gears. Driving stays mostly the same in a Definitive Edition, though when accessing your garage, you do get the benefit of seeing the stats of your car, so you know which has the best speed, braking, or acceleration. Like the getaway, it's not the controls that are the issue, but the experience of driving in general. You know what's just as annoying in video games as it is in real life? Driving the speed limit. Look, I'm not a psycho advocating driving at 90 miles per hour in a school zone, but I think we can all admit that we probably never drive at or below the speed limit, unless there's a cop driving behind you. That same philosophy applies here, though much worse, as if you go just a teeny little bit above the speed limit in front of the boys in blue, they'll come after you. Now if you pull over, they'll just give you a fine. Just be careful not to reach for your wallet too fast or else it's bang, wow. bang, bang, try to shoot him in the back. But if you fail to stop, they'll actively be out to arrest you. Commit some crimes or crash into the police trying to escape, they'll put a kill on sight order on you. At this point, just about every cop in town will be after you, and they'll set up roadblocks to try and slow you down. This is on top of the cops being stupidly good drivers. Their car is fast enough to overtake your own if you're not driving the best of the best. Since the pain spray hasn't been invented yet, your only options of ditching the cops is switching rides, killing the pursuing officers, or making it back to Salieri's bar to finish a mission. Now the police are a nuisance, but not completely overwhelming. This isn't like getting a 3 or a higher wanted level in GTA 4. The real problem with them is, you'll never spot these assholes until it's too late. Making time missions, or ones where you already have a group of mobsters chasing you, and shooting at you, much more annoying. You can cap the speed of your car at the press of a button, so it'll never exceed the speed limit, but you have to remember to turn it on every single time. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it does add a lot of unnecessary busy work to driving around Lost Heaven. The Definitive Edition ends up doing the same thing, but you can customize how aggressive the cops are, can see them on your minimap, and can lose your wanted level if you stay out of their sight long enough. But that's not all there is to the driving, is it? No, that's not why you're here. You want me to talk about that level, don't you? A level so infamous that depending on who you ask, completely overshadows everything else in this game. You want me to discuss the race. In the mission Fair Play, Don Salieri tasks Tommy with helping him rig the upcoming Lost Heaven Grand Prix. By stealing and sabotaging the race car belonging to the European champ who is heavily favored to win the race. Once the car is sufficiently tampered with, he just needs to bring the race car back before anyone notices it's gone. Outside of the mission being timed and having to avoid damaging the car, it's fairly straightforward and not too bad. Yeah, well, that's the easy part. It's the final part of this long mission that had players tearing their hair out back in the day. Despite what we did to fix the race, the Don's driver ends up breaking his arm and can't drive. So they call on Tommy to take his place. Because of his original job as a taxi driver and being the best wheelman they have, Tommy is the best chance they have of winning the Grand Prix. Now, despite what Yakuza 5 may tell you, being a good taxi driver does not translate to good racing skills. God, I love this Goofy series. I can't wait to talk about it one day. So, only five missions into the game, maybe about two hours into your playthrough, you'll slam into one of the biggest difficulty spikes in all of gaming as this mission was stupidly tough. First issue is trying to get used to the handling of the race car. Its lightweight and higher speed in comparison to regular cars makes turning a nightmare. Pretty much guaranteeing you'll take a turn too wide or spin out completely, costing you precious time as you get the car going again. Then you got the other 12 drivers you're racing against. They're all fast and handle the track perfectly, rarely if ever losing control as they drive around turns. And even if you do manage to overtake them, it just takes one little screw up on your part for them to close the distance in no time. Then there's the issue of the length of the race, as you have to do 5 laps around a long track, just over 8 minutes of continuous driving. It's a very demanding race, necessitating a perfect understanding of the driving controls with little to no mistakes whatsoever. Well, it used to be anyhow. Yeah, the grueling difficulty of this race, one so bad that it caused a lot of players to quit the game, didn't go unnoticed by the developers. 
So sometime after the game's original release, the race was made easier. First by nerfing the speed of the other drivers, then by letting you set the difficulty level of the race before beginning, the only mission in the game that offers you that option. On paper, I kinda get what the original intentions for the race were. Like a lot of other things in the game, the devs wanted a realistic approach to it. You're just some random schlub who drives for the mob, put in an environment against professional drivers who have trained and raced for years. Of course you're going to get your ass kicked. It's only from repeated trial and error and increasing your skills will you be able to overcome this mountain of difficulty. The problem is this mission is so early into your playthrough and the driving you've done up until this point is nothing like the race. So the overwhelming majority of players are going to get frustrated losing over and over again. Especially since this isn't even a racing game in the first place. And since the internet was still in its infancy at its time, it was very unlikely they could go online for help or find a guide. If I remember right, there was some kind of exploit you could use on the track to cheat and take the lead in the race, but obviously not everyone would know that. If anyone's curious, I did try this race on a higher difficulty level to experience what it was like back in the day. And uh, yeah, I got my ass kicked pretty hard. So I knocked the difficulty down because I don't have hours or days to spend on one level. The Definitive Edition rebalanced the race as well, slowing down the other drivers and shortening the race down to three laps. They do end up using more traditional rubber band physics like you'd see in other racing games like Mario Kart, so they can quickly catch up to you even if you had the lead. Despite playing it on normal, this version of the race did take me a few tries. A challenge, but not an overwhelming one. Though, like the combat, you can tweak your settings to recreate the original brutality of the race if you want. So unlike I normally do with my videos, I'm not going to get into my whole playthrough and discuss the story level by level. Instead, for the sake of time, I'm going to discuss some of the differences and approach to level design each version of the game has. It basically boils down to simplicity versus spectacle. To explain what I mean, let's compare the opening level of both games. Tommy is on a smoke break from his job as a taxi driver when he has a fateful encounter with Polly and Sam his future associates and members of the Salieri crime family, who are currently running from rival mob goons belonging to the Morello crime family. The two men hold Tommy up at gunpoint, forcing him to drive them out there and escape their pursuers. You then just have to outrun the Morellos and after you're successful, the two men will ask to be dropped off at Salieri's bar, where the boss will give Tommy some cash for helping and to fix his taxi. Escaping your pursuers just amounts to outspeeding them and can be done in about a minute. You'll spend more time driving these guys to the bar. Simple and to the point. The Definitive Edition on the other hand requires you to drive through some blockades to avoid the first group of guys, then avoid a roadblock set up by more guys, drive through some more blockades to ditch the remaining pursuers. It goes on for much longer, adds more objectives to go to before ditching the Morellos, and add some cinematic camera shots when you drive through a blockade and the other guys crash. It's what every AAA game does nowadays, trying to feel more cinematic and over the top, i.e. a spectacle. For an even better example of what I'm talking about, there's the mission Better Get Used To It. After Tommy walks his love interest and future wife Sarah home, protecting her from a local gang of street hoods, Don Salieri is pissed taking it as an insult that these guys would start shit in his territory. He puts Tommy and Polly to put the fear of the dawn into them by breaking every bone in their bodies. Heading to their little hangout, you'll go through an unassuming alleyway, being up thugs along the way, getting into a brief shootout before chasing after the leaders of the gang and killing them both after their car crashes. The definitive edition starts like the original in the alleyway, but pivots into a spectacle almost immediately. As you'll chase the gang to a repair shop, blow up some barrels, and knock out an electrical pole that lights up with sparks and electricity, also taking out the shop's sign. Then you'll continue to fight through the shop and start a fire while killing everyone inside. The mission ends the same way with you chasing after the gang leaders until they crash. I'm not trying to say that the definitive edition leaning towards spectacle is a bad thing, more so that it's doing exactly what you expect from the AAA gaming space. Whether keeping things simple or making them more cinematic is better is going to vary from person to person. Personally, I'm getting kind of bored with cinematic games. 
It feels like nowadays they're all cut from the same cloth. Trying to be this epic story with extended interactive cutscenes, with over the top characters, relatable modern dialogue, and average gameplay at best. Some do it better than others, but at the end of the day, a good game should be able to keep my attention with gameplay alone and not reduce itself to jingling keys in my face every 5 minutes because it's worried I'm getting bored. I wouldn't say Mafia Definitive Edition is the worst in this regard. If anything, they're pretty restrained compared to your typical Sony game. But it's hard not to notice after playing it in the original back to back. And to its credit, it doesn't do it for every mission, though it does still lose some of the atmosphere created in the original version of a level. For one final example is the mission A Trip to the Country. You drive out with Polly to some farm in order to meet Sam and collect some whiskey being imported from Canada. But on arrival, Sam and the guys he's making the deal with are nowhere to be found. It's dark and raining, the abandoned farm creating this foreboding atmosphere that you'd find in a horror game. The tension rises as you wander around, a feeling forming in the back of your mind that you're about to stumble upon a gruesome sight or get ambushed by a serial killer or something. The Definitive Edition ruins that atmosphere, mostly because of the UI telling you to go investigate in specific areas, Tommy commenting on what he finds, and spelling it out for the kids in the back that clearly the deal was ambushed. I get that trying to find the dead driver in order to move on to the next scene would be confusing in the original. It did take me some time to find him. But maybe using the environment, like a blood trail or very obvious tire tracks, could have worked to communicate where to go without treating it like baby's first murder mystery. So where the games differ greatly, and will probably cause the biggest amount of arguments in the comments section, is the characterization, appearance, and voices of several characters. I'm not going to point out every single difference of every character that was changed, Instead, I'm going to focus on the five I consider most important. Our lead, Tommy, his buddies, Polly and Sam, their boss, Don Salieri, and finally, Tommy's love interest slash wife, Sarah. Now, because some of these characterization differences change or recontextualize key scenes in the game, I am going to have to go over parts of the story here, too. I will save spoilers and discussions of the game's ending for the end of the video. I used to be a taxi driver. Even though I wasn't making much and I worked from dawn to dusk, I was glad to be working. Let's start off with Tommy. Initially, he's just another guy trying to survive during the Great Depression, keeping his head down and trying to make an honest living. It's just by pure bad luck that he runs into Polly and Sam while he's working, forced to drive the pair to safety. While he escapes the ordeal and is generously compensated with enough cash to fix his taxi, and then some, Tommy is reluctant to take Sam's offer of more work for the Salieri family. Despite the lucrative money he can make, he'd prefer a quiet life of being poor than getting wrapped up with criminals. Unfortunately, the guys chasing them the night before recognize his license plate, smashing up his taxi and forcing Tommy to run to Salieri's bar for protection. While his motivations change throughout the course of the game, in the opening hour you really get the sense he's a man out of his depth and just doing what he has to in order to survive. With Tommy's original voice actor, Michael Servino, doing a solid job showing off his anxiousness about becoming a criminal, being rather quiet and reserved when he's just starting out with the family. Now in the definitive edition, he's completely different. During the initial chase sequence, instead of being a nervous wreck, he's practically showing off to Polly and Sam as he drives through roadblocks. Hold tight, I'm gonna try something. Who were those guys? When dropping the pair off at Salieri's bar, he seems more like he's bored rather than terrified at what just happened and potentially getting killed by Sam. Then the scene that takes place after he runs back to Salieri's is completely changed. Instead of having no options but to work for the Salieri family due to being marked by the Morellos and losing his job, here the Don offers to pay for the repair of his car again, but he rejects it. Instead, he asks for the chance to get revenge on the guys who wrecked his livelihood. I appreciate that, sir, but I'm not looking for a handout. Then what are we doing here? I just want a shot at the bastards who wrecked my cab. I wouldn't say he's eager to prove himself. It's more like he's reckless and oblivious to what it means to be a gangster. 
His new voice actor, Andrew Bongiorno, also gives him a gruff and more stereotypical thug voice. I wouldn't say his voice acting is bad either. In fact, in some ways I actually prefer it over the original. But it's obvious the developers wanted to change his initial characterization. Maybe they were worried a more meek and nervous Tommy wouldn't fly with today's modern gamer. I'll admit it's a bit nitpicky, especially because of how much Tommy changes over the story. But I don't know. I feel like him going from a meek guy keeping his head down and trying to survive, who ends up corrupted and blinded by the mobster life, works better than some dumb kid who recklessly leapt into the mob life. He also ends up coming off a little more brutal in the definitive edition, as he's a lot more eager to kill two characters he spared in the original. He still spares them here, but the circumstances of why are much different. Though it flips it around when this version of Tommy accidentally kills an innocent civilian, an event that haunts him throughout the game as opposed to the original where we get this line instead. Damn, that's one hot dame. Tommy's characterization in both games can be inconsistent at times. He works better in some situations and worse in others depending on the game. I can't really say which version of the character I prefer, but I do feel like the definitive edition's ending works better than the originals, but I'll get to that soon enough. One spot I feel they did really improve Tommy was his relationship with Sarah. Sarah is Tommy's wife and is introduced in the mission, appropriately titled, Sarah. The bartender at Salieri's bar, Luigi, asks Tommy to escort his daughter home as some street hoods have been harassing her. Tommy does just that, beating up the street rats when they inevitably show up, impressing Sarah so much that he sexes her immediately afterwards. Sarah was an angel. I had a lot of girls before that, but that was something different. Very different. It was clear to me that if I was going to spend the rest of my life with someone, it would be with her. You must be joking, right? They then get married off screen and have some kids together. But she's barely seen in the game afterwards. So, yeah, despite a big reason he's betraying the Dawn and squealing to the feds, is to protect his family. It's jarring how insanely underdeveloped Sarah is. If you wanted to, you could use the framing device of Tommy interviewing Detective Norman as an excuse why we don't see more of his family. After all, he's confessing to a bunch of crimes that can put his boss away for life. What the hell does this cop care if you're being sincere about your family? Well, actually he would care, because he's a family man himself. And he's apprehensive of listening to Tommy in the first place. So if he smells self-serving bullshit, he'd probably walk out of that cafe. The other thing is, you can't expect the player to believe and care about Tommy trying to protect his family when we never see that family. You have to give me something, anything, to make me believe that Tommy is doing it for them and isn't a self-serving asshole using them as an excuse. Doesn't even have to be a mission. Can be small little interactions where he talks to his wife or plays with his kids. So the original falls painfully short there, but the definitive edition handles it better. We're introduced to Sarah before her title mission. She has some actual characterization and a backstory to her. She grew up around mobsters. Don Salieri is her godfather. She hates her mother for being a drunk and abandoning her. These factors have made her rather tough in her own right, so she isn't one to take shit from some street punks. So when they do show up, she gives them the business, knees one of them in the groin, and she doesn't immediately fuck Tommy because he saved her. We see them spend more time together outside her dedicated mission. Tommy ends up proposing to Sarah after a particularly traumatic mission, and we do actually see his family show up. It's not perfect, as we never see Tommy interact with his kids, or even learn their names for that matter. Best we got is his daughter popping up in the ending, but it's something. Stepping away from Tommy and Sarah, let's talk about his best buddies Polly and Sam. If I'm being honest, both Polly and Sam didn't leave much of an impression on me in the original version. Part of it is that there really isn't a big focus on either one until right at the end. Polly comes off as just a generic NPC who serves the family and you're chummy with. 
A stereotypical mafioso that helps Tommy when he first joins, but he's not really portrayed as a mentor. Meanwhile, Sam is quiet and more professional than Pauly, but he's basically Princess Peach as you have to rescue his ass quite a few times throughout the game. There's a sense he has a bigger reverence for Don Cilieri outside of him just being their boss, but again, that's not really expanded on until the end. There doesn't feel like there's much to him outside of just working for the family. Both of them just feel way too flat for me, and it really doesn't feel like the trio are this tight-knit group of friends like Tommy claims they are. The Definitive Edition, on the other hand, fixes these problems with both of them, and honestly ends up making them my preferred versions of the characters. With Polly, well, with Polly, let's get the obvious thing out of the way. He sounds like Master Shake. No one else knows you here, so tread careful, okay? Sure. Are you fishing for compliments? You know, that's a horrible personality trait. Nobody no, likes no, 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 no. Yeah, it really caught me off guard and is so different compared to his original voice. Me and Tom will fix it. Do those bastards think this is freaking Luna Park or something? I'll rip them apart with my own hands. That, while flat and line delivery at times, sounds more like your typical gangster. That said, I got used to it rather quickly. And honestly, I ended up preferring this voice over the original. Polly in the remake is goofier and acts as a comedic foil to the more serious Sam and Tommy. Cracking jokes and palling around with his buddies. While not obvious at first, his demeanor is a mask he wears to hide how he really feels about the mob life. You see the first crack in his interaction with Ralph, where the kid makes a joke about both of them being cripples. In the original game, he just laughs it off. Here, not so much. See, see, you're still a limping. Guess we got two, 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 two cripples working here. <laughs> we ain't nothing alike. You got that, Ralph? Sh 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 show up, Papa Polly. Yeah. I didn't mention it before, but in both games, outside of the obvious stuttering, Ralph is portrayed as slow and suffering from some mental disability. But his gift with cars earned him a place in the Salieri family and their protection. So while Polly likes to joke around, he doesn't like it when that joke comes at his expense, or to be compared to and looked down on like Ralph. You see another crack after winning the Grand Prix, as he ends up getting wasted and making a fool of himself at the celebration party. Chow says moo and the chicken says quack. What does the bird say? With Tommy tasked with scooping him up and taking him home so he doesn't embarrass the family, during the drive, as he drunkenly rambles, you can tell that he's proud of Tommy's accomplishments, but is also jealous of the attention and praise he's been receiving. Polly points out that he and Sam do the heavier jobs for the Dawn, admitting that he gets nervous every time he's called to go meet him for his next mission, having done some real bad things for the family. And, unlike Sam, he isn't able to just go home and forget what he's done. As the game progresses, with the mob war between the Salieri's and the Morellos escalating to more and more violence, it's obvious it's all becoming too much for him. He's treated with less respect in the family, controls less businesses and rackets than the others, and as he's pushing his 40s, feels distraught about being alone at his age, and that he still hasn't found a woman. Polly comes to the realization that maybe he isn't cut out for the life anymore, and is desperate for a way out. That desperation is what ultimately pushes him to try and pull a bank heist towards the end of the game, even if Don Salieri would never allow it as opposed to the original, where the bank heist is just out of pure greed, with Polly unsatisfied with what the Don is paying him. The definitive edition ends up making him a much more tragic figure, a glimpse of what Tommy could have become without his family. Sam in the remake is a little more talkative compared to the original. How you doing, kid? Dino, Lou! You got business with the Don? He acts sort of like the stern older brother to Tommy and Polly, keeping them both in line as they work together. You see him socialize more and having fun with some girl after the Grand Prix. And later on during a meeting with the Don, Polly jokes about the two of them often visiting a brothel that Tommy is ordered to blow up. A gentleman's club, just down the street from St. Michael's. The Don has invested a lot of money in it over the years. So me and Sam. Regardless... Sam's reaction is actually kind of interesting. Not embarrassed or even mad, but what I could best describe as a bro, what the fuck look. Think like if a buddy of yours overshared something about you to a complete stranger. Sam looking like he just got exposed. 
like he really isn't as professional as he wants others to think. The mask slips even further in the same scene, where on top of blowing up the brothel, Tommy is ordered to kill a call girl named Michelle who is feeding info about the family to Morello. Sam protests about making Tommy kill a woman, but it's not about protecting his buddy from doing something seriously heinous. It's about the woman, Michelle. As it turns out, she just so happens to be the girl we saw with Sam earlier. Seems to be his regular call girl when visiting the brothel. But more importantly, the information she got about the family most likely came from him. Though it's not intentional, and it was probably just small pill talk he shared with her, it again goes to show that Sam isn't above screwing up. He does actually seem to care about Michelle though, as when alone with Tommy, he'll beg him to spare her, asking him to let her skip town and giving Tommy the money to help her do that. I should point out that in the original, this entire mission and situation with Michelle is completely different, as she has no connection to Sam and is instead linked to Sarah, being a close friend of hers. When Tommy realizes this, that's when he has his change of heart and decides to spare her on his own, telling her to leave town and never return. As the game continues, you start to see Sam at odds with himself, struggling with being an obedient soldier for Don Salieri and a friend to Tommy and Polly. Like Polly, this makes him a much more tragic character and ends up changing his motivations during the ending. And finally, we got Don Salieri. Well, it looks like Morello is really trying to make me mad. But I'm a reasonable person. I'm not going to dwell too much on him. As in both versions of the game, he's portrayed as your friendly neighborhood Don, a man who rules his territory with kindness and respect, as opposed to his rival Morello who uses fear and power. But as the game goes on, you see he can be every bit as bad as his rival, capable of being just as ruthless, petty, and uncaring of his own men. It's later revealed that he and Morello were once friends who served under Don Pepeno, until they betrayed him and divided up his territory. This discovery and the fact he lied to Tommy, Paul, and Sam about a job ultimately sets up the events of the ending and motivates Tommy to turn his back on him. The key differences between both versions is that in the definitive edition, his ruthlessness comes a lot earlier and is more on display. Discussions with his consigliere Frank shows that the boss was always petty and quick to anger when things didn't go his way. This changes the reasoning for why Frank ends up betraying the Don and the family in the mission Omerta, when it turns out the old man had stolen the family's account books. In the original, he was being blackmailed as his family was being held hostage by the Morellos and the feds, so he was backed into a corner out of fear for their safety. In the remake, the same thing happens, but Frank had long grown tired of the life and had expected the Don to kill him sooner or later, so fearing that even if he went to the Don for help saving his family, Salieri could end up killing them or him anyways, he chose the safer option of just trying to run away. The Don being more ruthless here may be less subtle than in the original game, but it works better to explain Tommy's motivation for betraying him. More importantly though, it works to explain Sam's motivations in the ending. Since I already went through several chunks of the story through these different parts of the video, I'm going to speedrun us to the final three missions and the ending. I very rarely, if ever, provide a spoiler warning, but if you don't want the ending of both games spoiled for you, feel free to skip to this part in the video. After Don Salieri won the war against the Morellos, his rival and his associates all dead now, things are much quieter in Lost Heaven. Though with Prohibition being repealed, a huge source of income has been wiped out for the family. One day, rather casually, the Don puts the boys to work stealing a large shipment of cigars, which ends up confusing them as they're unsure of his angle. He explains it's mostly because he just wants some cigars, but also that they can resell them to their clients. During their little heist, Polly mentions to Tommy and Sam that he's been casing a local bank for weeks, and if they'd be interested in pulling a heist with him. Both men decline as Don Salieri wouldn't sanction such a risky job, and they don't want to go behind his back either. When Tommy and Polly successfully escape with the cigars, they end up breaking a crate by accident and discover some hidden diamonds. Polly thinks maybe they should take some for themselves, as the Don didn't mention anything about hidden diamonds and probably doesn't know about them. Tommy, on the other hand, isn't too sure, 
suggesting they see if the Don knew or not. When Salieri shows up, they offer to carry the crates into the warehouse for him, but he very awkwardly rebuffs him, insisting he can have some other guys do it instead. That's enough to convince Tommy to do the bank deal with Polly, as they now have proof the boss isn't paying them their fair share. The remake, on the other hand, changes things, and for the better in my opinion, as it ends up creating a much more emotional scene. Right off the bat, the boss is up front that the cigars are just a cover to get his hands on some diamonds. Except that he's lying. Where are the diamonds? There ain't any. This is the real score. No. No, 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 no. Don said we would get diamonds. You can open every box. You're not going to find them. We put our fucking necks out on the line for this shit. Looks like it. As it turns out, the boys were unknowingly smuggling drugs instead. The reveal is a lot more emotional, not just because the boss didn't tell them, but because up until now he's insisted they never deal drugs. Polly is angry at this betrayal, as if they were caught moving drugs, they would have spent the rest of their lives in jail. Sam, who is here to find out this time, is visibly confused about why the Don kept the information from them, and tries justifying it, assuming the boss had some good reason for not telling them. Like before, the Don still doesn't clue them in about what they were really moving and shoes the guys away so someone else can unpack the crates. Frustrated and angry, Polly finds the justification he needs to pull off the bank job and get the money he needs to start a new life, with Tommy agreeing to take part. The boys hit the bank the next day and successfully make away with the cash, planning to lay low for a bit before spending their money. This leads into the final mission, where Tommy heads to Polly's to get his cut of the money. The definitive edition adds a cutscene with him and Sarah, where he suggests taking the family to the shore for a few days, his wife rightfully suspicious of his nervousness and that he's obviously trying to lie low. Arriving at Polly's place, we step into his apartment to find him dead and the money gone. His phone will ring afterwards, with Sam on the other line, too late to warn Polly of what was coming. Don Celieri found out about the bank job. Since Tommy and Polly did it without his consent or giving him his cut, he ordered both of them killed. Tommy needs to disappear and needs to disappear fast, but he'll need some money to get out of town with Sarah and his daughter. Sam agrees to lend it to him and they decide to meet at the city gallery. Unfortunately, our good buddy isn't here to save Tommy. Don't move, scumbag. Oh, shit. Surprise. <laughs> you weren't looking for that at Paulie's by chance. Sam, what's going on? I thought we were meeting alone. The situation's changed, Tom. Turns out it's a setup. He was the one who snitched to Don Celieri about the bank job and got Polly killed. Now his attitude and the reasons for why he betrayed them are different in each version. In the original game, Sam is incredibly smug when you meet him at the gallery, talking down to Tommy and revealing he was never really his friend. He stresses the importance of the business, and that the family should always come before friendship, betraying Tommy and Polly in order to look good to the Don and move up in the family. Goodbye, Tom. It was nice knowing you. Take good care of him, boys. And please, don't make him suffer. He's my buddy. After surviving his trap, shooting through the Salieri goons, catching up to and gravely injuring him, he will continue to stress the importance of serving the family, calling out Tommy for his weakness, revealing he knew about the diamonds all along, but more importantly, that the Don didn't trust Tommy for quite some time now, as he knew that he didn't kill Michelle or Frank, as Michelle stupidly came back to the city and got herself caught by Salieri's men. This caused them to investigate whether or not Tommy killed Frank, and once they found out he was still alive, Don Celieri didn't hesitate to order his death. This solidified Sam's belief that friendship didn't mean shit. If the Don would kill his best friend of decades, why should Sam stand by Tommy and Polly? Before he's finished off, he warns Tommy that no matter where he goes, sooner or later Don Celieri will find him and kill him too. Friendship ain't worth shit. Oh, ah, ow. Uh -huh. 
I'll be honest, Sam's betrayal here felt weak at first. It wasn't until I began working on this script that it finally clicked what the original game was going for. And it's simply this. What expectation did we have that Sam wouldn't betray us? I brought up before how his character felt flat, and I really didn't buy that he and Tommy had this close friendship. And well, they don't. We know nothing about the guy. We never see him goofing off with the other guys. Every interaction with him is related to jobs for Don Salieri. Taking what he said before about this all just being business, Sam is our co-worker, not our friend. He's literally that guy that business articles warn you about. You know, the ones that warn you about mixing your personal life with your work life, and how a co-worker with bad intentions can use your personal life against you to get ahead at work. So it's less about Sam betraying us, and more about Tommy being naive into thinking they were friends. The Definitive Edition goes in a different and more straightforward direction, but I think it still works too. Don't move, Tommy. Shit. Hey, Tom. Sam. What the hell's going on? You and Polly. Put me in a bad spot. I know, Sam, but I'm sorry about that, but I need to get out of town. Can you help me or not? There you go again. Making me choose between my friends and the family. This is what you were looking for, Polly's. Here's your cut. It's more than you deserve. Sam. You killed him. You killed Polly. No. Polly got himself killed. And you seem real tore off about it. Sam isn't smug when Tommy shows up. Instead, he sounds disappointed and depressed, outright saying that he's being forced to choose between the family and his friends. It's also implied that he personally killed Polly this time around. He puts on this show that he betrayed his friends out of loyalty to the Dawn, but Tommy sees right through him and knows he only did it out of fear. Sam admits it's true, and genuinely sounds remorseful when he says goodbye to Tommy, and asks his goons not to let him suffer. Goodbye. Don't let him suffer, boys. He's my buddy. Skip to the end where Tommy has shot him several times and Sam is at his mercy, and he comes off so pitiful. He asks Tommy to spare him, and that he'll lie to the Don so he and his family can disappear, which is pretty hypocritical as he criticized Tommy for sparing Michelle and Frank. This time around, the Don found out about Frank's survival because Frank slipped up, getting spotted at some dog races in Europe, a crew being sent out to finish him and his family though Michelle seemingly did skip town and never returned. As he lays there dying, he calls out Tommy for hesitating again, his last words reminiscing about the good old times the three of them had before Tommy ends him. You can't do it, can you? you always that little voice in the back of your head. Maybe sounds like your baby girl, or Sarah. Always telling you not to pull that trigger. And you can't make up your mind. It's getting easier every time you open your fucking mouth. <laughs> we sure had some laughs, right? Remember that time? Me, you, and Polly. <laughs> This version of Sam is a more sympathetic and tragic character. He wasn't some asshole trying to get ahead, just someone trapped between the choice of loyalty to the family or his friendship with Tommy and Polly. It's why making Don Salieri more ruthless works here, as not only do we understand what he's capable of, Sam's choice ends up coming down to one simple thing, survival. The exact reason Tommy joined the family in the first place, in the original version. Yeah, they kind of muddled things here by changing his personality. After he leaves the gallery, 
Tommy is on the run and sets up the meeting with Detective Norman, bringing the story full circle and back to the present. With Detective Norman agreeing to Tommy's terms of giving him and his family new identities and protection, on the condition he testifies in court. We'll then get a voiceover from Tommy summing up the fallout. The Salieri family goes down, life sentences thrown all around, and Tommy getting eight years in an isolated cell from the general prison populace for his own safety. The definitive edition adds a little more, actively showing Don Salieri, Vincenzo, Ralph, and the other members of the family getting arrested. Also, we see that the eight years in isolation wasn't exactly a cakewalk for Tommy, as he's very clearly losing it while locked up. Also, when the game skips ahead to the 1950s, it shows an older Tommy speaking at his daughter's wedding, reflecting on the importance of family. Both games end the same way. Tommy watering his lawn when two men approach him and address him as Mr. Angelo. In the original, he replies confused and is clearly surprised when he turns around and sees one of the men holding a shotgun before they open fire and kill him. While in the remake, he isn't surprised and knew this day would come, clearly looking like he's at peace with his life before they kill him. Props to the remake for keeping continuity and showing Vito and Joe killing him. As for who they are, I'll talk about them when I get to Mafia 2. As he lays dying, the camera will pan away from his body. In the original, he's all alone on his lawn. While in the remake, his family is there as he passes away. Some might find it a little cheesy, but I like this ending and version of his death more than the original. Not just because he gets to die with his family beside him, though it's probably an absolute nightmare for them, but it helps sell that he really did do this all for his family, accepting his death because he knows they're safe. In the original, it paints him as naive and like he learned nothing from his time in the Mafia, forgetting what Don Salieri first told him when he joined, forgetting what Sam said, forgetting that they found Frank, and forgetting that the life will always catch up to you. I messed up. So did Polly and Sam. We wanted a better life, but in the end, we were a lot worse off than most other people. You know, I think it's important to keep a balance in things. Yeah, balance, that's the right word. Because the guy who wants too much risks losing absolutely everything. Of course, the guy who wants too little from life might not get anything at all. And that was Mafia and Mafia Definitive Edition. I already answered this question at the start of the video, but I can't really say that one version is better than the other, and both do really have their merits. I'm a big advocate of trying out games in their original form, regardless of how old they may be. The original Mafia has aged surprisingly well. The controls are still good, the graphics look great, the music is solid, and it has good voice acting. It runs really well on modern machines. I only had it crash once through my entire playthrough, and my only gripe with it is that there's no full screen borderless window mode, and that's more because I can't alt tab and keep the game up while I'm recording. Instead, it minimizes it each time. Its only real barrier to entry is its higher difficulty compared to modern games. It expects a lot of the player to properly strategize engagements instead of going guns blazing. If you have the patience or just want a game that doesn't hold your hand, absolutely play it. The Definitive Edition adds everything you expect from modern games, which I may have sounded dismissive about, but there's nothing wrong with wanting a simpler experience. And since it has a more compact design instead of this big open world, you may end up more invested to play and see the game through the end. Whether you decide to play the original, the remake, or both, I think you'll walk away with a great experience that will motivate you to check out the rest of the Mafia trilogy. And that's the video. Thanks for watching guys. Oof. I'll be completely upfront with you guys, but I am seriously exhausted. As I've done nothing but work on this video since I finished the Punisher one. Playing both games back to back wasn't too bad. If anything, I'd say I managed my time better in doing it than I did playing Saints Row 2. It was more about figuring out the structure for the video, and making sure to compare the most important parts of both games. It's why I didn't list out every little difference between the two and why I didn't go the usual route of recapping my playthrough mission by mission. Otherwise, I would have ended up making the video too bloated. So, I'm going to take a small break to recharge my batteries and finish up Tears of the Kingdom. Let me know what you thought of the video and how I handled the comparison between the two games. If you liked it, I might do the same with other games that have a remake. For example, Yakuza and Yakuza Kiwami. 
If you've watched my videos, you know I'm constantly throwing in gags and music related to the Yakuza series, so I'd love to finally get around to talking about it. I'm not sure what the next video will be, but I'll be covering Saints Row the Third next month. I'm also planning to take a different approach with that video as well. I might take a look at other Rockstar games like The Warriors or Manhunt, thinking about doing the Getaway Black Monday, maybe finally getting around to Stranglehold, and I'm debating returning to God of War and covering the second game. Even though I said I'm a bit burnt out and taking a tiny break, with summer on the horizon, I'm actually eager to do more videos. Though it's mostly because my workload at my job shrinks down to almost nothing, and I have even more time on my hands. I also kind of want to do a fuzzy recommend series. Smaller videos in between the big ones where I can discuss a recent game I liked and played. It would be on smaller indie stuff I'm enjoying, but let me know if that sounds interesting to you guys. If I kept to my schedule and didn't screw this up, this video should be dropping on Memorial Day. So to my fellow Americans, happy Memorial Day. Thank you to those who served and those who are serving. Again, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and comment down below. Did you play the original Mafia? Do you prefer it or the Definitive Edition? And if you're new to the channel, I'd love it if you subscribed. Check out the recommended video and playlist here at the end. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.